And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Broken Ruler Games, probably, beca probably because the, the rule is probably broken because, um... Because the writer was left-handed. Yes, I'm making a Catholic school joke. Be and, cre and creator of the upcoming Pandora Total Destruction. The one and only, the warden himself, Todd Crapper. How you doing tonight, man? I am doing excellent. And I love the intro that you just did there. Very nice. I like very much. I've, ha I've, ha I've had my fair share of um, practice with, with doing that. Um, <laughs> I gotta get as I try to get as close as I can to to em, to emulating Michael Buffer without actually get, doing something that would get me sued by the Buffer family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> that's safe. Yep, yep. Um, so I'll start. I'll start with the humble beginnings, as I often do, as it's tradition around here. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games, and what was it that made it stick? For me, actually, it was the board game Hero Quest. Um, that was the one. Uh, some friends of mine had uh, taken a trip out together over the summer, and when they came back, they had found this game Hero Quest. Um, and for those who don't know it, it you know basically it, it's a, a fantasy dungeon crawling board game mm -hmm. uh, published, I think, in like eighty eight or eighty nine or something like that. It had some you know uh, input from Games Workshop in there. And um, that's what got the ball rolling. We just obsessed over that over the course of the fall. Uh, back in like 1992, I want to say it was. 91 or 92. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it was just like, and then we played that, got all the expansions, played through all those, uh, played through them repeatedly, and got to the point where we're just like, well, we need something else. Like we were on this huge fantasy dungeon crawling kick. And then that's when a comic book store opened in town and they were selling copies of AD&D. And then that's when we just got right into that. So I credit my role-playing start with Hero Quest because that's what created the itch that made me want to say, you know, like, more, where there's more. It's a bigger book. I'll take it. Bigger books, more <laughs> books, and all this other kind of stuff, you know. Just created this ravenous indulgence of role-playing games that, that leads to the addiction that I have today. Mm -hmm. And first, first off, it's fun. It's funny that that was one of the rare that Hero Quest was one of the rare cases of um, of Games Workshop actually working with another company without trying to screw them over. Um, and se second, it's I do find it amusing that he, that you brought that you bring up Hero Quest for a cu for a couple for a couple reasons. Um, one. Is the is the glorious meme that is the best thing about Hero Quest is more Hero Quest, and <laughs> two, um, it seems in my experience that there are two board games that are that are almost required playing for anybody who's getting on a fantasy kick. Um, Hero Quest is one of them, and the other one is Talisman. Yes, we tried that once, and um, I don't remember. I mean, I do remember seeing the box and everything like that. Um, and yeah, it, it, for whatever reason, that one didn't really seem to stick with us. But yeah, I mean, oh man, I'm all of a sudden having like major flashbacks because I can kind of, I think I see the box right now. But yeah, for us, it was Hero Quest. I mean, like, you know, that was just the, the right balance of board game, but with kind of like this new element of, you know, you know, being introduced to someone being a you know a GM and all this other kind of stuff, and then it, for us, it made a very easy transition into D and D uh, in a way that I think maybe it kind of gave us a bit of a leg up because you know, especially too in the early '90s, you know, there wasn't YouTube or anything like that. You know, like the only way that you could learn something is to read it and then try and do it yourself and translate all this gibberish mm -hmm. um, or to have somebody run it through with you. And I feel like we kind of 
felt like we had a bit of a leg up. And this is, oh, okay, so it's just like when we do this and here and all this other kind of stuff, except you're rolling this. And, you know, and it's not on a set board, you know, like we can just do whatever and all this other kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was, even then too, like I, I have an, an old copy of the board game myself. I have a five-year-old son. He loves that game. Uh, my wife loves that game. So every once in a while, we just start going through a bit of a kick of just running a whole bunch of hero quests. My son even has his own version of the game that he calls Hero Quest 100. And he'll just make up stuff as he goes and everything like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, like, that's one. It's prob I still consider it a role-playing game, even though it doesn't meet the technical qualifications of it. But, I mean, for me, that that's always my go-to definitive answer. Which I... I could, I could certainly, um, I could certainly see that. It's in, um, it's in, it's interesting that that the other thing that's interesting about that being the introduction is there are certain there are certain games that I've seen the more traditional inclined um, folks in RPG communities um, deride for being too gamist, which will always be funny to me because well you're playing a you're still playing a game, yeah. Um, but, but throughout that, now, but now, by the time I found out about um, Broken Ruler Games, um, you had already had a you had already had a sizable um, amount of different projects. I think I think the first time I found out about you was right around right around the time that screenplay was starting to come around. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, so. I always, I always try and see. I always try and piece together a ch a chain of events when it comes to so when it comes to someone's um, game development lineage. Um. So I'm um, I'm curious. I'm curious. Was um was Killshot the first game that you had ever developed, or was there one before that? Because, um, check checking the da the date uploaded on like Drive Through RPG isn't always reliable. Yeah. 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 Well, when I first got started with actually making and publishing games, that was just about 20 years ago. Um, I had an article published in Dragon Magazine, which, you know, kind of sent me through the roof and all of a sudden was just like, that's it, I can do this for a living kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 20 years later, and I, I'm still not doing it for a living, but I'm getting better at it. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, um, I had... Uh, put out kind of, you know, like some proposals for some ideas that I had to some third-party publishers, because this was in the beginning of the D20 days, so the OGL license was now available. Mm -hmm. And I had uh, Shane Garvey, who ran a company uh, called Emerald Press uh, Publishing, and he responded with this one that I had, which was a D20 um, supplement all about mazes and labyrinths and that kind of thing. And he ended up having to walk away from everything, but basically said, well, you know, why don't you go ahead, take the reins and, you know, keep going with your project and whatever else you want to do with it. So I ended up taking over Emerald Press and basically turned it into my own thing and did numerous, I think at least 50 to 60 D20 based products uh, that way. Um, and then in 2010, I was involved in a very serious car accident and, and ended up being you know basically in recovery before or a couple of years and it's my lifetime my idea is to go through completely different and that's how kill shot and in a sense broken ruler games came along because i wanted to try something that was completely different and rather than trying to shift the whole publishing company over with me i thought no let's just put this to bed bury it lock the door um and maybe come back in a few years but otherwise, start with something new, and that's how I started doing Broken Ruler games, uh, with Killshot being my first 
true original creation from the ground up. And while it was a struggle in so many ways, because I was going through all of these, you know, like, you know, the recovery, you know, physical recovery, mental recovery, emotional recovery, and all this kind of stuff, I was able to actually start pouring that angst um, and fear and everything that I was going through personally and put it into this game that was all about professional killers and kind of, you know, like let out some of my anger through this product. And it was really cathartic. Like even too, when I go back and, and read it, I can very much see the state of mind that I was in while working on this. And even when I don't intend to, I start to realize when I'm working on my games now that there is very much a part of me. There's something that's going on in my life that's a part of it that really motivated me to, to really push forward with that kind of stuff. And so that's one of the main things I find with, with Broken Ruler games. For me, it's about making the games that I want to make for myself and then the goal is to try and find other people who would want to go in this direction too. Mm -hmm. That's really what it comes to. These are about, you know, making the things that I want to make rather than something that's trying to fit a very particular mold, work with an existing system or any of this other kind of stuff. You know, it's all about like, yes, that's great. I can go to Ikea and get step-by-step -step instructions, but I just want to take these various planks of woods and assorted screws and everything that I've found. I just want to make something of my own and then we'll just see what happens. You know, that, that's very much my motivation when it comes to making stuff. And now I'm very much addicted to making games from the ground up. It's, it's a bit of a compulsion. <laughs> now, that brings me to, Pan to Pandora. So... You st now you've um you've built Pandora as um Aki as Akira meets X Men, but where did the where did the central idea um kind of see kind of um get seated in your mind regarding how this was going to work? Well, some ideas start with a rant, um, and that's where this one came from. I was at uh, uh, Breakout Con in Toronto a couple of years back, having breakfast with a bunch of friends. And we started talking about, this was just before, sorry, it was just after uh, Avengers Infinity War came out. So, of course, a lot of conversations starts talking about what are they going to do in Endgame and all this other this kind of stuff. Um, and then we were just talking about superhero genres in general. And, you know, I started talking about, it's like, you know, the one thing that really kind of gets me with these movies and a lot of others is just, it always feels like, you know, you're, you're asking these people to be able to do something that is near impossible, but the way that these characters are trained and the way that their, their teachers and mentors talk to them, they'll use these really kind of BS statements just like, you know, calm your emotions, mm -hmm. you know, focus your feelings, follow your heart, and all this other kind of stuff. It's like no football coach is going to say that to anybody. It's just by, like to throw the ball dig deep within yourself and find that core that will let you throw the ball. Just like, no, you're going to get them to go out into the field and you're going to get them to throw the ball hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And so I was getting into this huge rant about, you know, like training sequences and, you know, how do you teach these people to use their powers and all this kind of stuff. And then it just kind of led to me discovering how would I want to do this? And once I started figuring out all the individual pieces, then everything just started falling into place. And so it, it really came with this need to really kind of explore just how hard it is to do something that is impossible to describe. You know, like, you know, like you shoot lasers out of your eyes. It's like, oh, okay. Um, how do you not shoot lasers out of your eyes and then how do you actually try and you know, like focus a beam so that if you wanted to just blow up a tiny little padlock on a door versus blow out the entire wall or something like that you know and that's where pandora really started with um and i've just realized within the last couple of days actually too um because one of the things that i'm still doing as part of my recovery it's it's one of the things you never really recover from mm -hmm. the kind of accident that i was in but I've been going through a lot of what's known as neuroplasticity, which is basically um, kind of teaching your brain to uh, be better than it actually is. The, the whole concept of is that 
that the brain does not stop developing once you become an adult, that it is constantly in a state of repair and adjustment and correction and everything like that. And using that to kind of help with quite a few cognitive issues that developed for me, that I started realizing just a couple of days ago that in a sense, what I've been doing with my neuroplasticity um, is very similar to what is expected of these supers of just like, you know, if it's very difficult for me to explain how it is that I'm able to teach my brain to do the things that I have been able to do lately, because, you know, it's just like a thing. It's very difficult to explain. And I realize that's the same kind of issue that these supers are having to go through. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, that's really how it all started with the whole rant, you know. Yep. Which, like, it's definitely something I can I can see. Um, especially, especially given how you're how you're going with you're going with characters that are bl that are blatantly over are blatantly overpowered. Um, and the, but I'm guessing that that whole de that whole development thing is the reason why you were going with a very um, narrative centric approach. Like I'm, I don't want to say that this is a full on narrativist game. But it definitely has some le has some narrativist leanings. Oh, for sure, mm -hmm. for sure. In fact, one of the very first terms that is described in the game itself is the term triggered by the narrative. The whole idea is that things only happen when they're described at the table. Mm -hmm. And and the whole purpose for the mechanics is not to determine how much of a badass you are, but it's more to determine okay, where can a story go from here based on this situation? And so, yeah, I mean, like, it, it, it's very narratively focused because we're talking about, you know, characters with the potential to basically, you know, uh, wipe out a city block, you know, if things get dangerously out of control. So setting something that's more kind of a simulationist to basically say, okay, well, in that case, then my power, I have energy beams, I roll 50 d20. You know, it, it starts to get into the ridiculousness of it, you know, where you're starting to compare how strong is the Hulk compared to Spider-Man. Does it actually matter if the Hulk is stronger than Spider-Man? Or is the emphasis more on, well, the Hulk does this, and the Hulk is the character who does this. What we're concerned about is how badly things go when he's not able to control that power. Mm -hmm. So that's why it goes with a more narrative focus, because it's really more so about, you know, what situations are these characters being put into because of their powers. Which, that, may, that certainly makes sense. And given that, do you, consider this a, do you consider this a game that's better served as a GM-less game, or do you consider this a case where, the, where it's better served if the GM is a revolving door situation? Because... I could, because I could see certain issues, not not necessarily not necessarily to say that it's more that would be more difficult with a standard GM approach, but that it might res, it might result in some complications. Well, it is a, a game that does have a GM, but at the same time, too, that's because once again, that's kind of more of one of my preferences. When I initially started working on the system, it was intended to be. Uh, a single-player GM-less game was something that you'd be able to run yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but then the more I started working on it, I just like the idea of having a, a team of other misfit supers um, that you'd have to be working with and everything like that. So that while one person's fighting a giant robot, someone else can say, I'm going to go help those people in the bus shelter kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, it, it is one of those things where um, in Pandora... Uh, or PDT, as I like to call it for short, the GM is really there to kind of act as a guide to kind of help, you know, the players as they start to get settled and accustomed to everything like that and to work as the adversaries moving forward. Um, but, I mean, at the same time, too, it's a very cooperative game, whereas the GM is not even really in control of the story. What the GM is doing is basically representing the world and the NPCs that are in that world reacting to what supers are presenting. It's a very player-focused game where the players have a very active role in the story, 
there's even mechanics that allow them to specifically create scenes to determine what it is that they want their characters to do next, you know, and then bring the kind of others on board. So everyone has a chance to kind of say what direction they want the story to take mm -hmm. uh, over the course of a three act structure. So, yeah, in this particular case, the role of the GM is is different than normal because I want to have the, the players be able to really focus on their characters and what they're going through and everything like that. Um, and then give the GM something, you know, to do. But at the same time, too, I'm a big fan of treating any GM like another player at the table where it's not just about, you know, here you go, here's, here's the script, here's all the props, and here's everything that you need. Now go and feel success at everything going smoothly. What I like to create are games where... You know, the GM basically says, I don't know how this is going to go, and it's going to be awesome because it's going to be a surprise for all of us, not just all the other people on the other side of the screen. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes, now, given, given that, um, let's talk, let's talk a little bit about the, about the setup that you have with it. Um, with, now, with so, with a lot of games that are go, that are going very out there, especially game, especially uh, games that are go with that are using like a um, a wide net of a genre. Um, I'll get the easy question out of the way first. Okay. Do you consider Pandora to be a superhero game or a supers game? Um, a supers game because at this point they're not heroic yet. They have the potential to become heroes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, well, I guess it's almost kind of one of those things where it could go either way, but I would definitely call it a super game. The, the goal is to become superheroes, but you don't necessarily start that way. And the room is totally there, you know, because these are characters like in Pandora, basically, things have gotten very much out of control. There are so many people out there with powers. And some of them are incredibly destructive. Um, that 10 years prior to the start of the game, um, someone accidentally opened up a black hole in the middle of Pittsburgh and wiped the city out. And so that's what has now led to the formation of these Pandora Academies because people have realized, like, we can't just have people with powers just run around all over the place. What if they're incredibly dangerous? We've got to do something about that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's been very much like these are... Uh, people who have once been heralded as heroes and have now been pushed into the shadows, they're outcasts, they're feared, um, that nobody wants their help anymore because they're just terrified of just be like, well, they could be worse than the people that they're trying to fight. And so in that way, there's, you know, you're starting off with characters who are really kind of struggling with like you know their own identity it's like well what am i supposed to do with this power even if i do get out of this academy and everything else like that um there's definitely room for these characters to become villains or maybe for one of them to become a villain and the others can move on to become heroes but really what it comes down to is these are people who are just trying to learn how to control a power that could kill thousands of people by accident they just want to learn to control their powers so that they can move on with their life. And now they have this opportunity to become heroes if they want to go in that direction. So I would call it a supers game because it's, it's open-ended as to what direction that they can go. Right. Um, something else that I'm curious about is art is a response to other art in a lot of cases. And... When I was when I was going through the preview document of Pandora, <clears throat> I um I ended up think I ended up thinking about what sort what sort of supers you may or may you may or may not have delved into, and we're and we're writing this as a bit of a res, a bit of a response to um, the one that kept the one that kept cropping up in my head was aberrant <laughs> and. Something I'm cu something I'm curious about is what exp what your previous experiences have been with supers and superhero um, ga um, RPGs, and what some what some of the things what are some of the things in them that 
you didn't exactly care for that you want that you wanted to address in your own way with Pandora? Well, when I was a teenager, I read a lot of Marvel comics. There were a few DC titles here and there, but most of the time it was because... Uh, so, like, when John Byrne started writing for Superman, mm -hmm. I had already noticed John Byrne's work from some Marvel series, and so, boom, I moved over to try that out. Um, and the, the one series that really stuck with me the most was the West Coast Avengers. Um, and then when John Byrne took over, he called it Avengers West Coast. Mm -hmm. And in that one, it was very much you were really seeing, and it's not to say that it was doing it exclusively, but for me, as the series that I you know, actually read consistently from issue one until I think about 87, I think is when I dropped out. The, they were stories that were also about their personal struggles of, you know, what it means to be people who happen to have these powers and then existing together and the, the bizarre dynamics and personal issues that come with being part of a team behind the scenes and everything like that where you've got a groundskeeper who's a retired super, you know, who it turns out is suicidal. Mm -hmm. um, you've also got a married couple. One of them is a former spy who has no problem killing people. Well, the Avengers, in the comics at least at that time, were not about killing. And then there is a storyline where that comes to a head. Um, you know, there's a lot of this that, you know, that you've got, you know, you had Wonder Man, who is basically this super strong and vulnerable character Who's trying to be a movie star? Well, which is he? Is he a superhero or is he a superstar kind of stuff? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was the one that really kind of stuck with me the most was the sense of finding their personal lives to be as engaging as the battles that they were facing and everything like that. So I know that's something that really kind of carried forward with me. I'd say John Byrne's work probably overall like when he did the next men which i've gone back and read and now i'm not as impressed as i used to be at the time but that whole idea of okay so here's someone that you know uh wakes up and has superpowers they go super fast you know they're like the flash so he goes out and he runs across the desert to go and get help and then when he gets back to land he's got legs the size of tree trunks you know He's, the character has to wear these big baggy pants from now on because he's got like these massive compared to the rest of his tiny frame massive massive legs mm -hmm. you've got a character who is completely invulnerable well what that does is it eventually bleaches out the color of her skin until she's like ghostly white um she can't cut her hair because her hair is invulnerable she can't cut her nails um you know it was just like a really interesting way of looking at the problems that can come with having powers and how it changes you and warps you and everything like that, rather than being, look at all these pretty people and their magnificent powers. It was just like, look what these powers have done to these people. Look how being a superhero has really screwed up their lives. Um, that's always this really interesting dichotomy that i've really liked that i've been able to put into pandora this whole idea of understanding the struggles that it must take to be a superhero mm -hmm. now i do want to shift gears a little bit into what you've called the story hunter system yes um, now for now first off i'll give i'll give you the i'll give you my usual props for the fact that you're using more than just the usual um, affair when it comes to dice, including hel including helping in my crusade to get rid of the lonely D12 meme. <laughs> yep, yep. But I'll start with something relative, relatively small on the grand scheme of things, and that is the nature of, um, co of core power. What I'm curious sure. about is because of the fact that... The, that and I didn't see any. I didn't see any of this in the preview version. Maybe this is in the full book. But do you have? Are, do you have um, pages set aside for going into going into example powers? What would be a good example of a core power? What would be a not so good example of a core power? And the general um, do's and don'ts with it. There, it's one of those things. It's not a very extensive one. My plan at the moment is to basically use examples to handle these kind of things mm -hmm. but i mean it, it's also been something where i've never really had uh, too much issue anytime i've had anyone make up characters for it 
the whole concept of having a core power is you start off with, you know, you have one power. It basically does one thing. So you don't have super strength and fly. You either have super strength or you fly. Now, in this case, because the focus of, of Pandora Total Destruction is that your overpowered supers with very destructive powers, odds are, you know, like you'll be going with the super strength. Mm -hmm. um once you know like i get that part across to players and just be like it has to be one power not a multitude of power you can't be storm who can do this and this and this you know it's like no 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 no. eventually over time you will start to be able to uh, gain additional manifestations as it's known in the game where your powers actually can go so out of control that it actually allows you to create a new kind of extension of that power. So in the beginning, once I explained to people, you know, the whole concept of the core power and what it's there for, it hasn't really created, you know, too much issue. So there isn't going to be anything extensive. There's no list of powers or anything because it's a very narratively focused game and the kind of players that this game, you know, very much attracts. It doesn't take long for people to come up with something really wicked cool like i'm running a play by post game of pandora at the moment because i live in a rural area so playing online during the pandemic is not an option for me like even right now talking to you i'm actually in the back office of a, of a retail store that i work at um because that's the only way i can get a decent signal to do this kind of stuff mm -hmm. i i have to keep track of my mileage to talk online to people um so i have a play by post game that i run of pandora and in that one, we've got one character who basically uh, turns off like the, you know, I am not a science person, so I will totally get this wrong, but basically turns off the electrical charge of neurons that basically causes molecules to separate. So mm -hmm. what he calls turning things to dust. Uh, we've got someone else who basically um, is a time traveler, but can't control it. And so what they do is they actually alter you know uh, the situation around them but it creates these ripples that you know can have like really damaging effects there's another character that can actually control metal but can't control it well enough so that if he decides that he's going to make a weapon or do something else like this any metal from anything nearby basically just comes so like the i-beams out of a building all of a sudden come you know like pouring at <laughs> like just smash their way out of the building and it can actually cause things to topple. It can like crush a car and all this other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean like the, the powers that, you know, people have been able to come up with, um, especially too, when you go with it's, you know, one core power and it has to be very destructive. I've yet to have somebody say like, Oh, okay. I'll be super strong. It, it seems like everyone's got that one power that they've been holding on to. That's like ridiculously nuts. And any other GM has said, no, you can't have that. That's too much. It's just like, what? All I want is to be able to bring down the heat of the sun into a concentrated area. That's all I want to do. This is a game that basically says, yes, please have that power. Now, how do you think you're going to do with this kind of stuff and not kill other people? Mm -hmm. You know, so, yeah, it, it has not been an issue to date so far. I will admit that my own con my own contribution to that kind of thing, especially given the whole can but um, formula with the ones you've mentioned, is so is someone being able to control the relative mass of an object, but only when only while he's touching it, which is basically ah. his means of his means of taking um, cannonballs and thro throwing them at the throwing them at the speed of a of a um, of a high um, high velocity bullet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that's assuming that it works out well, because once again, like, you know, how do you maintain that kind of power or ability? I mean, like, these are, these are abilities that the human body, while in this case, is somehow able to perform these feats, how do you actually get the muscle memory, the cognitive knowledge or everything like that to say, you know, that's like basically saying to an epileptic, it's like, we're going to teach you how to not have seizures anymore without any kind of medication. It's just like, how do you do that? 
And so it's that, that struggle that, you know, the characters would have to go through. And then from there, over time, they could develop manifestations that would actually, maybe they don't have to touch it anymore. You know, which is like, what if they can just look at something and then change the mass of that object? And then what if they're able to bend it over so that they can change their own mass so they become like the vision, where it's just like, there, now I'm just going to float because now I'm just lightening my own mass and that kind of stuff. So it's one of those things where, you know, like even a power like that, the ramifications and the directions that you can take with it, uh, I find are really interesting. And not knowing where you want that power to go uh, once, once it's created, like once you've just got that core power written down, you don't know what's going to come of it because it's going to be based on how your character deals with the story as it progresses. You know, nothing's really written in advance or any of this kind of stuff. Everything's kind of made up as you play. Um, that's the part that I find really interesting is discovering where these characters are able to go as a product of the story that they create. And that's the part that for me is, is just really fascinating about this level of play. I'm a huge improv nut, um, but not the kind who actually likes to go on stage and actually do something with it. I just really appreciate improv. And for me, these kind of games are my form of improv. I have no clue what's going to happen. And I love the fact that I don't know what's going to happen because that means I can only be excited when it, when it happens. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that do, that does bring me to to, to the um, to the way you have a die system um, set up. What with what with first off the um, the die steps, which is going which I'd argue is going to be very familiar to to veterans of say Savage Worlds, but also the relationship between power and overpower dice because you're t because you're talking about overpowered superheroes in this. And one of the big things that I think that I'm going to be the most curious about is how that overpowered, that um, powerful but dangerous attitude is presented in the mechanics. Yeah, so the main thing with it is that um, when you use your power, you are at risk of creating havoc, which are basically points that you accumulate in the role. So unlike games where the focus is just exceeding a target number, um, what it is basically is that on your turn, you know, you'll create a target number that will be based on, you know, it'll start with a base number and then certain aspects of your character will be able to alter the target number. Sometimes it might be harder. Sometimes it might actually be easier because you're more motivated into the situation. You'll then basically roll either your conflict, interaction, or protection which basically determines the kind of actions that you're trying to accomplish with this. Mm -hmm. um, and then you'll basically be rolling against your target number. When you're using your power, you will also add your overpower die, which always starts as a D12. So right now, uh, we are playing with a couple of options on what the starting target number will be. But as it stands right now, all rolls start with the target number of six. So right away adding an additional d12 to a d8 or d10 or another d12 you're really looking at rolling way more than what you need and that can actually be where the problem comes in because your havoc is based on how far above your target number you roll if you just get one or two points of havoc that's okay your roll will still succeed and there will be like some minor collateral damage that will happen. You might smash some windows that are nearby. And there are some other options where you can have something happen to your character instead. So you can take a complication for your character rather than kind of force others to have to deal with what you're presenting. Um, but if you start doing three or more Havoc, it's gone so far overboard that the role technically counts as a failure you know, you miss what you're trying to do and instead create new problems. And then that's where things like, oh, those, you know, like those people that are over there, you know, like in the flower shop, well, you've now actually trapped them in all this rubble. Someone's got to be able to go in there and get them out. Um, that building, you've just taken out the support beams for the, that bridge 
And now if somebody doesn't do something, that bridge is going to collapse. It creates, you know, almost kind of like, in some cases, worsening scenarios that the supers then can choose to ignore to focus on their goal at hand mm -hmm. or to actually do something to try and prevent these things from getting worse. So that's really, you know, how that main mechanic comes in. So overpower is basically your power is not in control and can potentially make things worse. During the course of the game, you can basically have training scenes. And what they are basically is they take place in kind of like, uh, you know, uh, the danger room for the X-Men. It's safe. No one's actually going to really get hurt. But you get to get in there and really kind of flex your muscles, really get those powers going into full swing and start practicing with them without doing a lot of harm. And whenever you're able to successfully complete a training scene, you're then able to take one of your dice and actually lower it. Um, and that also can include the overpower dice. Mm -hmm. Once you actually reduce your overpower below a d6, it now becomes the power die, which basically you have now learned how to control your power. And instead of adding that die to whatever else you're rolling, it can now substitute you know, any of your other action dice. So it gives you that level of control. One of the kickers with it, though, is that while this story is taking place and you're trying to get your character to train how to use their powers and everything else like this, there is something that's going on at the Academy. Somebody's up to something. There's a growing threat. And if you choose to ignore that threat, you'll be able to gain control of your powers. But then that threat will go ahead and take over the world or blow up, you know, like something terrible. Something terrible is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So you'll be fully trained, but the bad guys are going to win. So it's that balancing act of, you know, well, we got to do something. We got to stop these people. And the Faryon's going to come and, you know, and is trying to actually control the minds of every single person over the age of 50. We got to stop them. So you don't have time to finish that training. You're trying to find that middle ground, so to speak, in there. So it's that, that fine line that you have to walk. And that's the part where discovering your character's heroic potential comes into play. Where it's like, even though you know things might not work out well, hmm. you are still willing to make that sacrifice to go out there and try to do something to help. Yep. Now... When, now, one of the one of the things that I know that I noticed with the when it comes to the risk of of things get of things getting out of control with the way the dice system and the way the um, mechanics are are working is the resource known as havoc. Although, although maybe maybe I should qual maybe I should qualify it as a as a um, chaos resource or or some or something like that simply because of the fact that. A lot of the descriptions for what havoc can do are ver are ver are a very case of you succeed, but um, yes. Now, get, getting back to the core get to the core power thing, um, do you have do you have um, do you have plans for an aside as far as how as far as how um, how do you in how to integrate someone's core power into those? So that the so that the ha so that people aren't um, completely in the dark about how they'd integrate somebody's power into these havoc situations. Uh, the, yeah, there will be um, a GM section, so to speak, mm -hmm. and that's one of the ways where I like to look at the GM, uh, especially in this game, as being very much a guide. Um, you know, so that there's going to be somebody there who will be able to take, okay, well, I read this about, you know, like how powers are supposed to work and the general intention and everything behind it. So I'm going to take that and then use that to help this character out with it. Um, it is a 96 page book, mm -hmm. the rules and mechanics and everything like that will take half of it. Um, and I'm still working on kind of kneeling down. A lot of times I don't like to fully write out a GM section until after uh, the Kickstarter has been run because questions like this one and other ones that come up from backers and potential backers can really kind of help shape, you know, like that's a really good piece of information that either quite a few people have been asking about, you know, or, you know, like this is a really good thing. I've never thought about that before. 
I was doing a chat last night uh, talking about PDT and the whole idea of the role of whether or not these characters would have like a super name comes into play. And I started thinking, you know, some of these people might have like a super name because they're actually trying to hide from their real identity. You know, like something terrible happened back home and that's why they're here at this academy. So maybe they have this new name to just like try and leave the past behind, you know, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, like it's definitely one of those things where um, being able to help explain the the reason why things exist, their purpose and their role in an open-ended way that isn't specifically telling people this is how you're supposed to be playing rather than this is the intent behind the mechanics, this is the intent behind these features. Take that and then use it as you need to to run the game. And there's always that overlying principle of if you need to, you know, break this or hack something to make it work for you and your group, go right ahead. Do what it is you need to do, because really the emphasis is on the story that you're creating with these particular characters. Mm -hmm. So there, there's definitely going to be room for something like that. It's just a matter of, um, I never really know how much room I'm going to have or need until, you know, um, I've gone through the crowdfunding, you know, I've gotten feedback from people through the Kickstarters and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Now, one of the core things that you have when it comes to the gameplay loop of Pandora is that people were rolling um, for the number of scenes that will that will take course in acts. Given the, given the fact that that it's rolled in this manner, um, is it a situation where there would be advantage and disadvantages to rolling a high and low, or would people want to roll high more often than not? Um, it's kind of one of those things where in the beginning, it's very, it can be difficult to actually, um, try, you know, and get a certain kind of role. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and especially too, because, you know, when players are starting to just kind of get, it's kind of settled into how Havoc works and, you know, like, oh, that's not good. That's bad. And everything else like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. And that is. One of those neuroplasticity things that I've been trying to work on. Could you ask me the question again, actually? Um, would, would, would there be advantages and disadvantages to, ro to rolling high or rolling low? Or is, it a, or is it a case that people mostly want to roll high for um, the amount of scene points that they get? Oh, yes. Um, there, I think there's definitely advantages to going high with the, with the scene roll. But it's also one of those things, the, the whole concept behind it, because each player and even the GM if, in each act gets to roll. So it basically kind of works out with the law of averages. Um, you know, if someone's going to roll high, someone's going to roll low. There is also a mechanic in there that you can pass on some of your scene points to another player to try and kind of help even everything out. Um, there, there are definitely advantages on the surface to making a really high scene roll because then it makes it feel like you've got lots of flexibility to create lots of stuff or just like, oh, I'm going to spend all of them on training scenes and all this other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I, I find overall because um, it, it, it's really about, you know, how it all ends up coming together. It really doesn't, I mean, like there, there are ways for all the characters to be able to benefit from any scene that other characters make. Um, you know, even if you don't actually spend scene points to help create the training scene, you can still benefit from a training scene. You can learn a lesson, you know, that can apply in very particular situations that you can use to help adjust the target number, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so I think the inclination is there high and get lots of scene points. But then by the time you get to act three, which is, okay, we know who we're facing, we know what's going on, and now we know what it is that we have to do. You know, by Act 3, the inclination is to basically, okay, what do we need to do to get ready? Now let's get out there and let's kick some ass. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think it's kind of one of those things where everyone feels like rolling high seems to be the way to go. But, you know, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's really, it's really not a good or a bad thing. It really just, you know, it, it kind of 
forces you to take the story in a certain direction. It's just like, okay, we don't have a lot of scene points in this one. So we got to be narrow. We got to be concise. What exactly, what do we really, really need to do? Whereas when you have lots of extra scene points, you can use that to get into a backstory moment of your character and say like, you know what? I want to have a flashback as to why my character had to come to the Academy. I think it's time we got into why my character hates all the instructors and everything else like that. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, given that act structure, would it be safe to say that a, sing that a, single, stru a single session where you're going through all three acts would be would be typically structured like a TV episode or like a or like a short film. I would say, if anything, uh, PDT really comes across being more like a limited series or a mini series. Um, the you know because a lot of this is really it's it's not about you know like oh the next couple of days are going to be wild and wacky. This is really about like you know okay we're here at the academy and we're here to learn. And kind of like with the Harry Potter books, over the course of a year at Hogwarts, these things start to kind of reveal themselves. And what's going on? And why is this, you know, why is there a giant three-headed dog in this hallway and everything else like that? Mm -hmm. So it, it really is about creating, you know, um, kind of like a, a, a long analysis of what these characters are going through. Um, so I, I like to look at it as being more of like a, a limited series with the potential of being picked up as a regular series, you know, once your characters have actually started to, to learn and, and converted their powers to using the power die and stuff like this. The game, PDT, simply focuses on, you know, that initial, uh, you know, kind of like the, the opening story. Mm -hmm. um, but the room is totally there to be able to continue taking that and, you know, carrying on with this long, lengthy campaign with these characters is that's the way you want it to go. All right. Now you've now uh, you've you've got you've you've had the goals set up at um let me make sure I get this right. Um 5000 Canadian which you're yep. currently at fi at 5.3000 at the time of this recording. Um what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? 96 pages. 96 pages. And yep. As far as a as far as a release window, um, are you thinking um, fall, or are you yeah, thinking fall, a bit later? Fall is definitely going to be the goal. Um, with everything that you know, I mean, it's a pandemic, and uh, shipping is an issue. Printing can be an issue. Um, you know, I'm fully trying to prepare myself for all of a sudden paper to just stop existing tomorrow, uh, and then what am I going to do? <laughs> So my goal is to have it out for the fall of 2021, but with so many different things that are going on and any number of problems that could arise at the drop of a hat, I have actually listed December 2021 as the delivery date on the Kickstarter to make sure I've given myself a bit of a buffer. Mm -hmm. Which is, cer is certainly understandable. That's, all that's also why I... Um... Uh, that's also why I focused on the digital version when it came to the whole release window thing because that's relatively speaking the easiest part of the process. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. And even then too, that's assuming it's like you know nothing happens with an editor, you know who you know uh, if uh, my editor suddenly needs to be able to take time off because you know uh, something is going on. Um, you know if things fall through with an illustrator, having some time to get back into that. So even too making something digitally. Um, it's never a guarantee, and it's less of a guarantee nowadays. I find. Yeah. Well, with with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the insanity at play here. Oh, well, no, thank you for having me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>